Uh, we have an internal joke at Resemble where we say that Andy Warhol has innovated more uh, with synthetic content than, than the world knows. Um, so we've published like papers on like the findings and the research that we've done on, um, you know, creating vocalizations that aren't producible by text-to-speech engines and how do, how do we do that? How do we, um, you know, uh, control expressive content uh, to a very high degree in terms of like having input just as text, but with like, um, you know, text-based predictions and accompanied by perhaps metadata that's like voice. Synthesia. Very excited to uh, chat with uh, Zohaib Ahmed from uh, uh, Resemble AI. So I'm going to bring him up. There he is. And uh, uh, Resemble AI is uh, another of the uh, the companies doing some really uh, really exciting work in uh, in synthetic uh, media, uh, particularly in voice. Um, and uh, uh, if you're a, a Netflix uh, watcher, you may have uh, already heard some of their work. But I'll uh, I'll turn to Zoe uh, now. Uh, Zoe, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the big uh, exciting project you're uh, you and Resemble have been working on uh, for the last uh, while? I'm sure. Absolutely, Eric. Thanks for uh, organizing this and thanks for having me here today. So, um, you know, like Eric mentioned uh, at Resemble, uh, we basically create uh, artificial voices. And um, we've been doing this for about three years now. Um, we, we generate hundreds of thousands. I think we've crossed a quarter of a million voices to create it on the platform now. Um, generate like years and years worth of audio content every month. Um, and in particular, one of the projects that uh, I'd like to share today was the, the Andy Warhol Diaries. Um, and I have this quote up here, if uh, everyone can see it. It's, uh, I'd like to be a machine, wouldn't you? Uh, that's from Andy Warhol. Um, when uh, the producer uh, and, and the director and the team behind the, the Andy Warhol Diaries reached out to us, um, there were quite a few challenges, um, but our biggest question was, why? Um, why? Why Andy? And um, the more they tried to convince us, the more convinced I got that this is arguably like the best project to introduce um, a lot of people to synthetic audio. Um, and there were basically three reasons why. Um, one, in the 1980s, Andy had an initiative to create a robot double. It's like he was predicting the future. It's like he was doing this like in the 80s, uh, knowing that I would be here today. Um, secondly, the, uh, the diaries were, uh, would be used and his voice would be used to create this immersive experience. If you ever heard Andy talk, um, he actually sounds kind of like a robot. Um, he's very monotone. Um, he has expressions, but, uh, he expresses himself in a very distinct way, uh, like many artists do. Um, and the third, which is, I think the most convincing thing is, uh, his diaries are like a written written piece of work, um, but the way they were written was he would call uh, uh, the the writer and talk to him or her, sorry, on the phone every night and basically tell her what he did during the day. So it was like an an audible experience, which was being like written down. Um, so naturally, when you're like taking his diaries verbatim from his his written work which is spoken initially kind of came together really, really well. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's kind of convinced us to go with Andy. Um, uh, here's the other problem though. So uh, microphones weren't great back in the seventies, um, unfortunately. So you had uh, data to work with, but very challenging data to work with. So, you know, um, you had data that was recorded in like a studio on like BBC on like a telephone call, et cetera. But it sounds like really distinct. Like I, I probably don't sound like, hopefully don't sound like this in real life. <laughs> hopefully sound a bit better. Um, so if you've ever worked with producers and have had the chance to, they're like as difficult as like politicians and the government as in like they're super picky about how things should be done. So they're like, no, we want this kind of voice. And they're like, well, there's only three minutes and 16 seconds of this voice. Um, they're was, like, well, this is the one that we want. Yeah. Oh. Um, so that, that's like the data problem. Uh, luckily, um, you know, um, the, the people who have been doing like artwork and et cetera, and even, even like the language models 
um, what you've noticed is like models have been able to um, take less and less data and kind of uh, use this technique called transfer learning. And it's like approximate uh, a lot better as to like what's not in the data set um, and kind of make these predictions a lot better. So luckily at that time, um, we had our models working where they were fairly good with low amounts of data, but this was still like extremely challenging to get right. Um, so that's essentially uh, what we took and we created his voice from there. Um, and then we realized like it wasn't just uh, when we started creating content, or rather the producers started creating content, uh, what they would say is like, just like um, I think Anne was mentioning earlier, it's like when you, when you do something with Dolly or uh, with, with like mid journey, et cetera, you, you type a prompt and then it's like you, you hit, I think what she said, you hit gold when it's like the right image, right? Um, with audio, it's, it's slightly different. It's like, I can make someone sound like Eric, but how do I make someone perform like Eric? In this case, like, how do I get someone to sound like Andy? That's one thing, but how do I get them to perform like Andy? So um, one of our goals that resemble is to always allow like a lot of creative freedom. So they shouldn't be thinking about how the voice is being created, but rather the type of content that they're trying to, trying to create. So in, in from the art perspective, you're not worried too much about how the art is being drawn you're worried about like i want the hair to look like this i want it like 8k or whatever um and i want like the blue, blue scarf or whatever so um here's like a, a little clip of like three versions uh, of one particular line and this is just three out of many that they created with subtle differences i wasn't very close to anyone although i guess i wanted to be i wasn't very close to anyone although i guess i wanted to be I wasn't very close to anyone, although I guess I wanted to be. So like three different versions of his voice and three different uh, performances of his voice rather. Um, and you can see like, there's like very subtle differences between them. And essentially what you want to do is like, you, you want to, well, we want to give uh, freedom to our users to like craft this content, how they imagine it should be performed. Um, and was this- so yeah, a so, sorry, so is this that then you had to get the approval of the producer, director, and presumably the uh, um, the Andy Warhol estate? Yeah, so uh, jump, jumping to that, um, oh, sorry. Let's too far before we, or going backwards rather, uh, before we took on the project, one thing that we're uh, absolutely, like it's, it's critical is that we do have consent uh, from all the parties. In this case, we had consent from uh, the Andy Warhol Foundation, uh, Netflix, the director and producer were on, on screen. And um, what was really cool is that they, um, they made sure that it was very obvious that this was uh, created uh, with AI. Uh, and also crediting like Bill Irwin who um, used some of his performances and we modeled his voice and his performance uh, over to Andy's, Andy's voice. So giving credit to the human that was performing as well uh, and, and also like the AI that was performing Andy's voice as well. So very upfront at the very beginning of every episode, it was a six part documentary or docuseries and beginning of every episode, the screen would pop up saying, this is the voice of Andy Warhol model by Resemble AI. At the end of every episode, a very similar screen would pop up, et cetera. So um, a, a lot of attention was given to transparency. And from our perspective, uh, a lot of our attention is always given to consent uh, while we're creating content. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite impressive. I, I did watch the documentary. I was, uh, I, I did I notice the, uh, um, just how close you were able to get the, uh, the voice. Uh, but you know, the, I, I know that one of the, your, your hallmarks is, as you, as you said, you know, creating a whole model from relatively small amount of data, uh, was, uh, did this sort of strain the, uh, the, the limits of, of the tech or did you have to come up with new, uh, um, technical, uh, uh functions to be able to work with such a limited uh, uh, amount, or I, I assume having a, a Bill Irwin there um, helped uh, make things a little bit easier for this particular project. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have an internal joke at Resemble where we say that Andy Warhol has innovated more uh, with synthetic content than, than the world knows. Um, so we published like papers on like the findings and the research that we've done on, um, you know, creating vocalizations that aren't producible by text-to-speech engines and how do, how do we do that? How do we, um, you know, uh, control expressive content uh, to a very high degree in terms of like having input just as text, but with like 
um, you know, text-based predictions and accompanied by perhaps metadata that's like voice. Um, you might have seen like techniques that have popped up within uh, um, within within computer vision, like very very recently. We're talking like like two weeks ago. Uh, I think OpenAI introduced something called outpainting, which is essentially you take an image and then you can like paint outside of the image. So we have some somewhat like very similar techniques. We're able to give it some context and then let it predict what the next outcome should be. Um, so quite a bit goes into like. Um, you know, transferring over the style and, and the prosody. And obviously, like you mentioned, Bill Irwin helps quite a bit. And so getting a human loop, um, you know, we, we don't want to take that out of the equation altogether. Getting him to do a performance, something like this. I wasn't very close to anyone, although I guess I wanted to be. And then, you know, getting Andy's AI voice to kind of carry over the pauses and the cadence and the emphasis on certain syllables. I wasn't very close to anyone, although I guess I wanted to be. So um, it human and loop is like equally important piecing it all together. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So is it, uh, so the final result is, I guess, a blend then of the, the model and the, uh, um, uh, impression, I guess, by, uh, by the actor. Yeah. So majority of the, um, docu-series was created with, uh, just the text speech engine. So it performs really well. It's the lines that are particularly important where the, uh, director, uh, and the producer wants to get a very particular message out to the audience is where Bill's voice comes in and, you know, he directs uh, the AI voice in a very particular manner um, for those passages. So uh, I have like a, a video clip here of like the final product that you would have seen in the documentary itself. Um, I'm just a freak. I wasn't very close to anyone. Although, I guess I wanted to be. So, uh, a lot when they piece it together, they're like getting Bill's voice to perform in certain pieces where they really think the voice is super important. And some of it's like, I, I can't even describe to you how producers work. This entire experience for, for me at least was like a little insight as to like how much thought goes behind every line that's delivered. Um, and and the, the nice thing here was that, uh, you know, like we were, uh, inside of this studio but what I mean by that is like we were on a zoom call and that was our studio and we sat there and you know uh, Andrew Rossi who's the director basically uh, looked at us and said okay generate that one more time and we created it then he would highlight something on his end be like okay I want this to sound like this how do I get that to work um, and a lot of that like interaction with like you know one-on-one -on -one with a person trying to use the product kind of tells you a lot about the frustrations again like I had mentioned like I've for people who have used Dolly or a journey, et cetera, it could be a frustrating experience to actually get an image. And you're like, it's almost like envious. You see all these like gorgeous images and you're like, why doesn't mine look like that? <laughs> um, so we kind of have to like, uh, we, we came up with a lot of interesting ways to like control the emotion and a lot to do with uh, the results with speech to speech that we recently introduced go into, uh, go into that realm of allowing our users to be able to control anything from like a certain syllable to a word to an entire like paragraph and how it's delivered. Um, going back to, uh, you know, as you mentioned, obviously being so careful with the, uh, the transparency and, and talking about who came, uh, what came from where, uh, does that then with, with the model now, obviously the, the documentary is, is complete. Is this model then still, you know, within your own, um, I guess, catalog or something you could offer to other customers, or is it then still owned by, by Netflix or by uh, the uh, uh, Warhol estate? Yeah, so uh, the model itself and every model that our users generate is always uh, controlled by them. Um, so we, we take the ownership of the model. Uh, the underlying data or the underlying rather uh, architecture of the model is always uh, proprietary to us because it's we built it from scratch. Um, but the data that, that was, um, created or curated for um, creating the model itself uh, and, and, and the model and the derivatives of the model are uh, belong to, uh, they always belong to our customer in this case, the, uh, in this case, Netflix and, uh, and the producer and director of, uh, of, the, of the series. Although uh, from what you said about the uh, um, uh, technical innovations that came from it, it's, uh, you're, not, you're not exactly walking away uh, with the uh, uh, empty handed at the end of that. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually really encouraging that, you know, we're, we're able to um, break 
down barriers uh, of entry to AI voices. And, um, you know, like there's a lot of motivation from how um, the work that OpenAI and especially Stable Diffusion have done to kind of make this technology accessible to more and more people. And a huge barrier of entry with voice is accumulating voice data. Um, it's it's um, very, very difficult to, to actually collect voice data properly. And for people who do like voice over acting, I don't know how many people have like during the pandemic have had to make like virtual presentations where they have to do their own voiceovers. And they realize like they sit down, they're like, ah, the presentation's like 10 minutes long, I'll be done in 10 minutes. And then they start recording and they make a mistake on every other line. Um, so even like collecting data itself uh, is, is a challenge. Wow. Uh, well, it's, it's a impressive uh, uh, nonetheless. And uh, yeah, definitely will be keen to see uh, as other projects uh, you guys uh, are working on. And uh, just uh, tell everyone uh, uh, where they can find out more about uh, the work that you and, and Resemble are, are uh, doing right now. Yeah, so you can always go to uh, resemble.ai. Um, you can sign up for free. You can build your own voice, um, type in some text, hear how you sound or how your artificial voice sounds. Um, there's a bunch of like marketplace voices or, that are available to our users. Um, and there's a bunch of functionality that uh, we're, we keep rolling out to more and more audiences. So tech, tech like speech to speech, which, which we're still slowly rolling out to our entire user base, um, localized, which transforms your voice into different languages. So it sounds just like you, but speaking Mandarin or Japanese, et cetera. Um, so you can do all of that stuff. Uh, just by going to the Zephyr AI. Synthedia. Synthedia.substack.com. Synthetic media, virtual humans, voice clones, deep fakes, AI image and text generation news and more. Hey, thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to help us with YouTube's famed algorithm. Oh.